The good folks at Comics for Fun and Profit have been doing two episodes a week um, for quite some time now, and it's all thanks to, first of all, Jason, and second of all, our patrons, who allow us to add the space on our server, broadcast more, store more, share more with you listeners. I'm envious of those of you who have unlimited storage and media server capabilities. We we pay for ours here at at the C4FAP. It ain't cheap. We thank you so much for those of you who go to patreon.com slash comics fun profit and contribute at any level to say thanks, to say I want to be a part of your Slack channel conversations. I want to get exclusives. I want to get early access. I want to get ad free access. I want to get swag. I want to get some free stuff. Whatever your reasoning is, we appreciate it at any level because it does make a difference. So from the bottom of Kyle and I and Jason's heart, thank you for contributing. Aloha. This is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I will be interviewing a friend of the podcast, writer Kelly Thompson. Kelly is here to promote her new series, Black Cloak. This is um, from Image Comics. Issue 1 comes out on January 11th. Issue 2 comes out on January 15th. And we will also briefly talk about a couple of her other Marvel titles, such as It's Jeff and Captain Marvel. Kelly, welcome back to Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's good to be back. So, and Kelly, thank you very much for coming back on the show. I mean, really, thank you very much. You know, of thank course. You. Now, before we begin the interview, I want to give a big shout out to um, Andrew Fitzgerald of Image Comics. And of course, my, my co-host Drew for affording me an advanced copy of Black Cloak. And then I did get some information from um, before, you know, some information um, before I, uh, for this interview from John Suntress's Word Balloon. That episode was dated December 12th of 2022. Now, listeners, if you guys get a chance, please check out that great interview. You know, Kelly, that was a great interview that you did with John. I, I, I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, Kelly, for our listeners, where can they follow you on social media? Um, I'm still on Twitter, although I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at 79 semifinalist. I'm also on Hive. I don't know if that's going to go or not, but I'm there as Kelly Thompson. Uh -huh. um, you can pretty much always find me anywhere as some version of 1979 semifinalist or Kelly Thompson. Um, I'm, but primarily these days I am on Substack, which is not really social media, but you know, it's a newsletter. It's mm -hmm. the best place to keep in touch with me. And that's 1979semifinalist.substack.com. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. And then also listeners to, um, me and Kelly will talk a little bit more about her, her Substack a little bit later in this interview. I'm just going to jump right in. So we're going to start talking about Black Cloak. Um, I'm going to read the opening of issue number one, because I really love it. Um, and this is how, and so please bear with me, listeners. So the location is 001.01. .01. The city is um, Krios, and it's dawn, the morning time. The last city in the known world, hundreds of years ago, there was a world-ending war, but victory was snatched from the jaws of defeat. The great evil was vanquished. The kingdom was united in peace. It's not going great. Turns out getting along better when there is a great evil to be vanquished with a common enemy. Without a common enemy, it's a fucking mess. And assholes are all too plentiful, as are murderers. Now, listeners, again, you know, that was the opening. That was basically the opening page of Black Cloak. And I love it because it's kind of a, like a little bit of a dragnet opening that sets the stage for the story. And Kelly, I'm going to say, to be honest, it speaks the truth on a micro home level and on a macro world level, you know, especially when if there's a common threat, we all band together. And then after the threat is gone, maybe a week later, we all become ourselves again. I, I just love it. It's just great, you know. 
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so many epic stories that we read, you know, they're all about <clears throat> coming together to defeat the great evil. And I think we love those stories and we love them mm -hmm. because they're powerful and moving and they're intense and they've got these great moments for, you know, incredible darkness and incredible lightness and hope. Um, but we all, we rarely see those worlds after our heroes succeed and i i like the what's next i like what comes after happily ever after and so um this idea that all these creatures came together to fight to f defeat something great and evil and mm -hmm. they actually managed to win but now you know a lot has been destroyed there's basically this one huge city walled city left and they're all sort of living together in it trying to survive Mm -hmm. And it's not going great because these are creatures that don't want to live next door to each other and don't necessarily like each other when they're not going to war. You know, it's a common mm -hmm. enemy, right? Um, mm -hmm. The enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. And once you take away that enemy, it's really hard to yeah. figure out how to live together. And so it's a really great way to talk, and not directly, but indirectly about you know, sort of class and race and yeah. systemic problems. I mean, a lot of the issue in Black Cloak for the citizens of Black Cloak is that while we meet our lead detectives, which are called Black Cloaks, murder uh -huh. detectives, homicide detectives are called Black Cloaks in this world, our two leads are Essex and Pax. And I think it's very clear from the jump that these are good people trying to do good work. Yeah. But this is not a society that trusts cops. And Less so yeah. the way we feel about cops, because it seems to be there's really disgusting systemic problems and racism and uh, really deep seated issues buried in a lot of our our own policing in our world. That's less true in this world, mm -hmm. but more that it's just a new idea mm -hmm. for these creatures they don't understand law and order yet. They're still getting used to it and they don't really trust it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, this is a place where if someone steals your crops, you know, you want to do a blood vengeance spell or something, mm -hmm. not take them to court or see them have to pay you back or whatever. So it's a society that's still trying to figure that out. And thus it's very untrusting of this new thing, even though our heroes are trying to do good things. Uh, but it's also happening at a time when, you know, the this murder, the first murder that occurs that sort of sets off the story is a really famous prince who yes. would maybe have eventually been a king mm -hmm. of Kiros. And uh, it's really, it's taking all the issues that have sort of been bubbling under the surface that they've just been trying to survive with. And it's basically set it to maybe it's going to explode now, like if we who who would kill this sort of beloved prince like what's really going on here mm -hmm. it's just like a lot of things are really on the edge in this city and it doesn't take much to sort of tip it over into chaos but they're right there <laughs> yes and you know i mean um it's I, yeah i i um so i'm kind of stumbling on words because i just love this first issue um because a couple of things is that it's it's an awesome blend of fantasy, science fiction, and police procedural shows. Mm -hmm. I love it. It it and you blend it in so well, and it's so natural. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I think Meredith is obviously a, you know a huge part of that. Um, when people ask why we would mix these things, my answer is usually, you know, well, they're all my favorite things. So why not put them all together and like see what putting them together, you know, sometimes that creates problems, but sometimes problems are a great motivator to further story solutions. So it creates a lot of interesting things, but it, I think it's Meredith who really you know, is the magic of bringing it all together and making it look and feel like one cohesive world, you know, in the hands of a lesser artist, I think, you know, it would be easy to see the cracks uh -huh. of trying to combine those things that don't always go together. But Meredith is an incredible artist. She's an incredible world builder. She's a genius with color. And so, yeah. you know, she really, she really knows how to dig into this and make it 
you know, to smooth out all the seams that you might otherwise have. And I think, you know, one of the things that excites me about her doing this, you know, her style is not for everybody. It's uh, mm-hmm. a little more abstracted. It's spare. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's um, it's very clean and sharp. And part of what I like, but mm-hmm. it still has a rounded softness to it sometimes, yes. like especially in her character designs. But yes. it does feel atypical for what you might think you'd find in a traditional, I don't know about Western fantasy, but a f- mm-hmm. fantasy, right? Uh, it's got some manga influence. Um, yes. I, I, I think there's like a lot of sort of South Korean influences in there too. Uh, she and I talked a lot about Arcane, uh, mm-hmm. that we were both loving that TV show, which is based off the uh, League of Legends video game, which I haven't even played. But the Arcane TV show, if nobody's watched it, it's an animated on Netflix. It's incredible. It's mm-hmm. incredible. If you like Black Cloak, I highly recommend it because I think of all the things I've watched, that's the thing that sort of comes the closest. And that's, I believe, an incredible French studio. So I don't know where they're taking their influences from, but like... You know, so drawing all these sort of influences mm-hmm. in and making that world feel not just Western mm-hmm. in its, yeah. you know, in its, in its, uh, sorry, <laughs> in oh. its, uh, in its influences and its approach, um, you know, so yeah, we, we had a really good time and she does incredible character designs for, you know, we really tried to expand out our sort of fantasy creature stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. you always end up with so many human creatures who just look slightly weird, and mm-hmm. we really wanted to push on that a little bit. So while our two leads are still, you know, mostly quote-unquote human-looking, yeah. uh, we, we really tried to expand your options and, and get creative with the mm-hmm. way this world works, you know? Um, and I'm going to say the other, um, let me talk about a little bit about the creature designs, too, because I love it where um, that... I know, um, like the um, when, oh, what is it? I I want to. I can't remember. It's like I think, uh, uh, I think it was Essex who was talking to that like the bunch of juveniles hanging around. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah. The little troublemakers, teenage yes. troublemakers, or preteen troublemakers, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The smoke, the smoke face juvenile delinquent. <laughs> Yeah, I love it because <laughs> you you can tell you know because um because um because um Meredith you know you can recognize you know these are these are the the thing I loved about her artwork is you know even you know, you recognize um they're recognizable they're 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 jubilant delinquents mm-hmm. but I love it when I think I forget in one of the panels I correct me if I'm wrong but I think there was one where some one of the kids turned to the smoke face and smoke face head disappears into his jacket or something yeah yeah and that's yeah. pretty cool you yeah. know <laughs> it's very cool stuff I I I can't remember I think that I can't the smoke monster the smoke creatures we call them shifters there that's the class yes and that's because they can shift their look like they can look like the smoke monster like that juvenile does but especially as they get older they can shift their shape so like this isn't in the story but in the world building and i hope we would do more and get to do this like drift uh shifters tend to be like assassins and things like that because they can shape change and things like that they're hard to track and stuff like that so you know a shape changing plus a little bit of magic you know can make like a really incredible illusion so i hope we get to get into some more of those crazy things uh there's so much fun world building to do but yeah the shifters and you know those those preteen kids are a great example of how great meredith is with the character design because when she designed um those kids and mm-hmm. pers- specifically romu is the shifter kid and okay. uh and iona is the little fairy girl or the the uh yeah the young fairy um they were so cute i was like okay well i'm gonna have to write them into more and so i ended up expanding mm-hmm. their roles and yeah. when she turned it those she basically first time pass on a character design meredith basically nails it mm-hmm. sometimes you want her to go back like a little something so when she did that the kid who has like the gas mask thing on in that scene just yes. just up or something which is such a cool design he's sort of the douchebaggy leader of the group and when uh-huh. she sent back the first design on him it was a little underwhelming and i was like 
it's probably fine because he's just a minor, super minor character. Yeah. I was like, but it's a little weird that he looks the least cool of the group when he's sort of the leader. And uh-huh. she's like, how about, how about this? And she sent it back with that crazy puffy jacket and the gas mask. And I was like, yes. oh my God. I was like, is it my favorite character now? Like, do I have to make this a better character because uh-huh. this design is so good? So that happens a lot with Meredith because she just, she just gets you excited about things. Um, You haven't encountered him yet. I put him on the... I put him on the, uh, you you got a reference to him in issue one when yeah. Essence is on the phone talking to uh, Sashenka. I think she calls him Sash. But like, okay. that's a character that Meredith has designed and just incredible, uh, really, really gorgeous. And like based loosely on some mythology stuff and like existing okay. creatures, but you know, then mm-hmm. made her own. It's really great. It's really great. And then the other thing um, I love about Meredith's um artwork is even though it's it's you know it this is like in a fan in in a fantasy world fantasy science fiction world it's still it's a recognizable world it, it you know I I can still recognize it that it's our world like when Essex I think like I want to say it's the third page where Essex walks into the coffee shop Mm-hmm. And it's clearly you can recognize it's a coffee shop. It's not like, you know, like it's not like a, a Hobbit cave and <laughs> they sell coffee. You, you, you know, yeah, or yeah. when or when they go to the police station, you know, this is a police station. Yeah. You know, it, it has that feel, even though you know the car- You know, there is there is all these different creatures, fairies, elves, yeah, um, goat creatures. You, you, yeah. you recognize it. And yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling to it. It's a comfortable feeling. Yeah. yeah, there's um, I don't think we did. We kept the police station pretty basic, mm-hmm. in part because we knew we were going to populate it with some different tech and a ton of characters. But I will tell you, you get to see the morgue in issue two, and pay a lot of attention to the little background details because uh, it's some of Meredith's finest, most subtle mm-hmm. work in there. Like she just did these really cool things that I wish I had thought of and written into the page, but she did them all on her own, and they're really fun. But very subtle little background things, you know. But just the kind of stuff that makes something sing, that makes you really feel that the that the creators care and they're paying attention, you know. Yes. Um, okay. So I know we talked a lot about Meredith, but I want to shift shift my focus to you. Like, how did you come up with this awesome story? And I've already mentioned that blends fantasy, science fiction, and police procedure, you know, into this series. Because like I said, it it works. It feels natural and it flows natural. Like what what, you know. Um, I mean, I'm always, I love procedurals and detective stuff, so I'm always sort of thinking about detective and PI type stories um, mm-hmm. anyway, and mm-hmm. the origin of this one was was really just, well, what if I do a police procedural, but in like a fantasy world, what does mm-hmm. that look like? Um And, you know, there's nothing, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Like plenty of people have done that where like, you know, you put a Western, but you do it on an alien planet and like, you know, just mixing genres a little bit. So Mm -hmm. I don't think we're reinventing anything here. I do think the sci-fi aspect, um, making it not just pure fantasy, but trying to um, tinge it with more science fiction than you would typically see, I think maybe that's a little bit unique but again we're not the only ones doing it there's plenty of examples of it existing out in the world i think um i think there this this idea was an evolution i think when i first came up with this idea it was a lot more about it had a different name and it was a lot more about the police aspect Mm -hmm. uh, in this world yes but that really changed over the last five to ten years as my feeling and i think the general perception of police institutions in this country has really Mm -hmm. changed um i'll i'm never gonna not love a great detective story especially because in our detective stories our detective is rarely the bad part of the system you know Mm -hmm. the guy that we're relating to is usually the guy who's trying to do the, the right thing no matter what or who's caught up in a system that's rough so 
you know, I, I don't think that's going to change. I think we're always going to love our detectives and our hard boiled PIs. They're typically good guys trying to do the right thing in, in bad situations. But I do think it's obvious that our relationship to the police has changed. And so of course this story changed too. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I, I don't think this, the black cloaks and the Kuros police department aren't corrupt the way it feels like our police are now. It's not a systemic thing, but it's just unfamiliar. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. The, the unknown is scary for all of us, I think. Um, we talk about the different races, um, and you've already talked about, um, you know, the races that you've created, um, you know, did, did you and Meredith, did, you know, do you, do you like have a, like a, um, like some type of Bible, because it sounds like Mm -hmm. you might have a Bible for your different races, yeah, I do have I do have a Bible, but it's a little outdated because um, it's both unfinished and outdated because what happened was, you know, I've been working on this off and on for years as an idea. And like at one point it was getting very detailed, like I was doing like family trees of characters and things like that. Like, but the more I got into it, even though it was fun and even though I figured that some people would really love that kind of thing. To be honest, it feels a little overwhelming to me mm-hmm. to get into that stuff like that. I prefer a story is a little more pure and mm-hmm. requires a little less like, you know, hard work and flipping back and forth to remember whose kid is, you know, whatever. So I just want to, I wanted to streamline it down a lot. Yeah. Um, one of the benefits of that is that I think while a lot of good ideas come from me, it also left me much more open to good ideas that come from Meredith or the world, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. for example, Dracona are a class, a species in, in this world. And they're the, the, the implication is they're somehow descended from dragons. We don't explain oh. it, but that's sort of mm-hmm. between the name and they have these sort of leathery wings thing yeah. and stuff like that. That's the idea in the world is that somehow they claim they've got a tie to dragon blood or whatever Mm -hmm. um and there's mention about dragon blood being very powerful there's this weapon called the dracona dagger which we see so you know there are all these sort of hints about this other this what the 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 breadth of this world right Mm -hmm. and like so a dracona was a character was a was a class i came up with in the very early stages but the shifter thing, you know, we were talking about that before. I don't remember when that came up, but I think that might have been Meredith's idea. Mm-hmm. I think she made, there's a photographer in the opening scene and she made yes. that guy like a smoke monster. And I'm like, well, if we're going to do that, let's make a character. And that's how we decided yeah. to make Ramu a, a, a shifter. Mm-hmm. But then there's like, you know, they're in an early scene, there's like flaming skeleton that yes, we call at the bar. That we call, yeah, at the bar that we call death shards. And that's like, we just stole that from Meredith's Instagram page. She just had this amazing drawing uh-huh. of a skeleton on fire drinking a drink. And I was like, should this be in Black Cloak? Like, it feels right. And she's like, uh-huh. I love it. I was like, can we call them death shards? And she was like, yes. So, you know, there's a lot of that fun stuff. And I feel like if I had like really done the Bible and been mm-hmm. completely closed off to it, like, would those of ideas have, like, been able to grow the way I wanted them to? So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Bible and an outline are very good ideas that I stand by. But I also think you have to be, like, not too married to what you're designing, especially if you're doing it on your own. Like, once you bring in collaborators, I feel mm-hmm. like that's when things really start to blossom and, yes. and become mm-hmm. sort of magical instead mm-hmm. of just this cool thing you've been, you know, sweating over by yourself in the dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you, ask you about too, or actually mention to you that, you know, um, and I want to mention to the listeners that this first issue is 51 pages. And, you know, it, it, I, it, it wasn't, like I said, the dialogue felt natural everything flows very smoothly and i'm gonna say that this first issue there's all it's 
very dense it, and in a good sense where there's a lot of layers on this. And like you already said, there, you know, it kind of covers like a little bit of systematic issues or race issues. There's also a little bit about, you know, deep secrets that are slowly bubbling up because like you said in the beginning, you know, there's a prince that's murdered, but, you know, I'm not going to say, I don't want to spoil, you know, where he was found or anything. Um, and also too, there's uh, also family issues as well. Um, like Essex, now, cor- now you can correct me if I'm wrong, because if I remember correctly, when I think when she entered into the gated kingdom, is that mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, um, when she, the castle area, yeah. The castle, yeah, she's, you know, um, I, because it, because she's called exile. They, yeah. they never reference her to, you know, her her name. I just thought yeah. that was very interesting. And, um, you know, was this part of your outline or did it, you know, like the family issues, the, uh, you know, the uh, the class issues, you know, was this planned over the years or did it just, or did it slowly come out like naturally while you're writing the story? Yeah, I think, you know, I have a really incredible family, so I'm not sure why I'm so drawn to found family stories of misfits finding each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I always feel like a lot of people who, are so into that idea and listen, it's a big one. I mean, the X-Men are found family, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's not exactly a, (laughs) it's not exactly an uncommon idea, but I've always felt like a lot of people who are really drawn to that idea probably maybe don't come, don't have a great family history themselves or whatever. And so it becomes so important, but I love it even though I have a great family. And I think it's just because it's really powerful. It's really powerful to find people of like mind or like ability or like thoughts or kindness or whatever it it makes you feel less alone in the world and it's a really powerful motivator and I think that especially because we wanted to deal with class issues it was Mm -hmm. good to have a character that had experienced both worlds and that while perhaps she was forcibly ejected from one and not loving that Mm -hmm. it was still like a choice she made and if you ask her i think she would say she prefers being a black cloak like she doesn't want to be in exile because mm-hmm. of all the horrible things that come with that but i think she feels she fits in this life she's in now as opposed to the one she was in before and we we unfold that slowly um there's about one flashback per issue i think and so we unfold yeah. some of the mysteries of that uh as, as we go forward through the series and it's going to have a, it, it all ties together pretty tightly into how it sort of explodes at the end. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, um, she's a, she's a character with a real conflict within her. Um, she's from two worlds, really. And I'm going to say that's the perfect segue into this question. We talked about a little bit um, before we did the interview. And now, now in issue one, in the later part of the story where Essex is in the gated castle area, um, you know, she's hurt, she's being treated inside the castle. Um, and the um and the the medical person um who's treating her wants to take her black cloak off just to you know, just to you know yeah, assess you know, her injuries. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But um Essex refuses to take off her black cloak, you know, and is there mm-hmm. a symbolic meaning to this? Like, is this really part of her identity and yeah, I think I think yes. I think she probably would have been hesitant to remove the cloak under any circumstances, especially when she's at the castle because it literally it may be a technicality, but it literally is protecting her a little bit to be there mm-hmm. because it protects someone who wears it yes. both figuratively and literally. Um but but her reaction is very extreme when people read it they'll see it's very intense and so there's more to it than just that and i believe issue two we already start chipping away at that so so yeah kelly off the cuff question because when you mentioned that you know there's a at least a flashback in every issue in issue number one there's a flashback scene um at the castle and if i correct me if i'm wrong there's there's like a cat-like creature that she ha- is a pet yeah so taka 
And okay. you actually see it in the, you see a version of it in that opening scene. Yes. Remember, uh, not the mermaids, but in the coffee shop. Yes. And that, and you're the second person to sort of pick up on this, but that's a bigger deal than people know. Okay. And there's, I mean, there's a very good reason you put the things you put in the first pages of a comic book. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you don't introduce a weird thing like the Taka that seems like it has nothing to do with anything mm -hmm. unless it's going to have something to do with everything. So that's a pretty big hint for people who are reading along. My off the cuff question um, is, it, it, you know, did you put that cat like creature um to honor your cat <laughs> <laughs> a little bit a little bit i think um i i'm a very big fan i've sort of talked about this a little bit a lot lately but um i'm a very big fan of non-human creatures whether they be <laughs> robots or pets or sort of upgraded pets like familiars or something um I, obviously jeff the land shark is a big success for me at, at captain or at uh, marvel mm -hmm. and um so yeah i mean part of you goes in part of it is just wanting to write what i like to write which is an animal familiar is super fun part mm -hmm. of it is wanting to recapture a magic of a character like jeff that really captures people's hearts and imaginations um you know i was recently watching andor which i think is wow. one of the best television shows i've seen in a very long time and mm -hmm. and honestly tough competition this year i watched some of the best shows i've seen in a very long time this year um but andor even though i was super connected to all the characters and i won't spoil anything mm -hmm. um i was at the toward the end of the series when the tension was so high and so mm -hmm. many characters were in vulnerable positions and I cared about them all. This isn't a failure of the writers. It's just the the incredible success of the robot character. I was beside myself worrying mm -hmm. about that robot. Mm -hmm. Not only that he might die, but that he might be left alone, which seemed worse. And oh. I was incredibly upset about it. So, oh. mm -hmm. yeah, I'm always sort of searching for you know, can I, can I build that connection myself with a, with a familiar character? Um, my book story killer has, um, my novel story killer has a character. It's a Shika, or Shiki, I'm sorry. And it's called Jeff and it's bonded with a, a character named Micah and people laugh all the time. Well, oh, are you sorry you named it Jeff? And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I named it and Jeff, Jeff, for the same reason. I think it's a really funny name for a pet. I love it. It seems very serious and hilarious. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, but Jeff in Story Killer, he transforms. He spends a lot of time as a cat, but he can be all sorts of things. Um, it's basically based on its will and its sort of quote unquote owner's will. Um but the way we structured it in Story Killer is that it's the first time that the Shiki is sort of in agreement with its owner as opposed mm -hmm. to being controlled by its owner. And so we're oh, sort yeah. of exploring that agency of that of that familiar and everything. So I'm very interested in these kind of ideas. And you never know when it's going to like hit and you've got a Jeff mm -hmm. on your hands or when it's just going to be like a little fun thing in a book. So. Mm -hmm. The good news is for the Takas, they have a big role in the book that I hope is going to land beautifully and really make a lot of sense for people and that we've built it the right way. So even if they don't become everybody's favorite pet ever, it's still going to be really great from a storytelling point of view, I think. so. Um, another off-the-cuff question, um, and if you're okay, what is your cat's name? <laughs> I have two cats. Okay. They are they are the monarch and Clive. Mm -hmm. And um you probably shouldn't name a cat after a supervillain. It's a bad idea, but no, he's <laughs> he's great. He's great. He's um he's arguably he's the more vocal of the two, so often on podcasts people will hear him crying in the background. <laughs> Clive Clive isn't as vocal, but Clive is much more a pain in the ass. So <laughs> <laughs> um Oh, darn, I, I lost, I forgot, oh, um, and you're going to have to forgive me, Kelly, because I forgot to look this up, like, um, for Black Cloak, just for the first story arc, how many issues are, is in the first um, story arc? The first, um, the first arc is uh, six issues, 
Oh, okay. And we're we're working on five now. Mm-hmm. And I, but I would say every issue is in in addition to the first issue being almost triple size. I think it's fifty one pages, something like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition to that, all of them are oversized. So nice. I think some of them are like twenty two pages or twenty three. Mm-hmm. I think one of them is twenty five. So mm-hmm. you'll be getting a lot of bang for your buck. The first issue is priced a dollar up because it's so large, but all the mm-hmm. others will be the regular three ninety nine price, even though there's extra content. Yeah, but I'm going to say, Kelly, you know, it's that first issue, even though it's um, correct me if I think like four ninety nine. I mean. You know, yeah, it's four ninety nine. Yeah, it's one dollar so, up. Yeah. If you guys get this, is it? You know, when I read the advanced copy, it's great. It's like I said, it's it was um, like I said, it's it's very it's a and I mean this in a very good way, Kelly. It's a very meaty issue. It has a lot of layers. You know, the story flows very very well. Um, the dialogue is very natural and it's characters that I can relate to and it's a world that I can relate to and it like I said and you know I'm going to say this it's like as after I've read that first advanced copy I I emailed you know Kelly to say hey you know are you willing to come back on the show you know because you know I loved it that much I really you know it was great you know yeah yeah. It's, it's very That's very sweet. I'm really glad that you respond to it. I mean, you know, you do all this superhero stuff and you're not sure if people are going to vibe with, you know, Mm -hmm. the thing that's not so Mm superhero-y. And uh, it's really rewarding and wonderful to to see you responding to it so well. Uh, And I'm glad it feels like a really, a really, you know, meaty first issue you know Mm -hmm. i think because i don't write with a lot of exposition and there are no captions in this except for locator captions um we sort of felt like it was more important than ever to really have a large number of pages in that Mm -hmm. first one just to help people really feel like they got it you know they got into the world they got into the characters and we gave them enough intriguing stuff that they want to come back i feel like because the writing is a little spare compared to what people usually tend to expect i think in a in an all new world type book Mm -hmm. i think extra pages really helped us there you know so that we didn't we didn't overload the pages you got but we did give you a lot of them so you made sure you felt like you're invested so yeah, I hope that's I hope that's how people feel that like they really got their money's worth and they're intrigued, you know, and want to see more of that world. Um, I just want to make one more comment before I start moving on to my question and my other questions. Um, um, because the murder scene when I saw Pax, you know, and I guess the other police officers when they're investigating the murder scene, the thing I loved about it was um the thing that you know the other hook that hooked me in right away was it was like oh my god it feels like i'm watching law and order it it it, it just felt comfortable it just felt great it felt again it felt natural you know that was pretty cool i i I just loved it yeah so um no you're welcome okay so um um now we've already talked about um now meredith mclaren your artist Mm -hmm. is that did i pronounce her name correctly yes okay so i'm gonna ask how did you team up with her um and and i know you said that she yeah she did amazing work on the colors as well too so if you don't mind how did you team up with her you know and yeah so meredith and i did my first published work in comics together uh, a book called heart in a box uh, that came out from Dark Horse. Um, and we, be, I found her slash we became friends through Sophie Campbell, who I should start, I had started to be friends with just sort of online. I was a big fan of her work and I was, you know, we were just sort of talking through her blogging or something. And she and I were became really good friends. And it was, I was wanting to do this hard to box thing. And I was sort of asking Sophie's advice. I mean, I would have loved Sophie to have drawn it, but you know, mm-hmm. she's very busy and she was certainly way above my pay grade in the sense that I hadn't published anything Mm -hmm. but she was very awesome in like recommending some people that she was big fans of that she thought might be cool and Mm -hmm. one of them was Meredith and the second I saw Meredith's stuff I knew that 
uh, it w- would look amazing if, if she was interested and mm-hmm. she was, and we put together a pitch. I paid her some small amounts oh, of money sure. for that pitch and dark horse eventually picked it up and we were sort of off to the races, but you know, I was completely a nobody. Nobody knew my name and Meredith was still struggling as an indie. You know, she'd done some really cool stuff like hopeless savages with, um, uh, Jen, um, my God, I'm losing my mind. Greg Rucka's wife, Jen Van Meter. That's her name. Okay. Uh, Jen Van Meter. And she, so she'd done some, a lot more cool stuff and some people knew her name, but you know, it's still a big risk on a new book. And so it didn't do super great, but honestly, I'm really proud of it. Like even now, when I look back, even though it's the first thing I did, Mm -hmm. I think it's a terrific book. And so, you know, I knew that Meredith, would be amazing to work with again. And we had, we had done a gem short, uh, not a short, uh, a story arc, I think five issues together on my gem run. Mm-hmm. And I loved working with her on that as well. So she seemed like the perfect partner for something like this. When I found out about the Substack deal and, and knew that I would have the the money to, to fund it, she was my mm-hmm. first call. And then, um, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot to put, um, and then you got um, Becca Carey. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to, but is she like the letterer? I forgot to write down what her role is in the black in black clothes. Be- Becca Carey did uh, lettering. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, some of those PDFs that went out were missing the Indicia page for some reason. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. Don't don't apologize. Print edition will definitely have them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then um, you know, and um, like you know, um, how did, how did you team up um with Becca? You know, so. With- I can't, I think I went to, I had never worked with Becca before. So I went to a couple people that I had worked with before, Uh but it was a super quick startup. So I I was having trouble finding people, but I got a couple great recommendations and all two or three people that I talked to that were too busy, Uh all of them Rebecca recommended Becca Uh and, um, and she had also worked with Jordi Belair Mm-hmm. on a really great book of theirs together um so yeah i she was just great and i brought her in and i had hoped initially that we would also be able to do some fun like world building stuff like data pages and stuff but mm-hmm. it ended up we just didn't have the money in the budget so we didn't get to do that but she does that kind of stuff too which is very cool mm-hmm. um so i knew that she could not only totally handle the lettering which was going to be pretty challenging because we knew we had a lot of a lot of crazy characters and we're mixing three genres. So mm-hmm. it's a lot to ask. Um, and you, and whenever you're building a world from the ground up, like really thinking about what that, what that, what that font is going to look like, how mm-hmm. those word balloons, like there's a lot of really fun choices in the early days. Um, when you're, when you and your letter are working on that, it was very fun. Um, that's not something I traditionally have gotten to do because, um, you know, Marvel comics, they just have their style, right? So you're not involved in that, but um, it was fun. It was fun. And Becca's been terrific. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I was very lucky. And then um, before I start um, going to the other questions, I forgot, um, do you want to give a shout out to anyone else? Like, was there an um, um, editor on on Black Cloak? Sure. Uh, Charles Beecham is our editor on Black Cloak. He was also my editor uh, years ago on my Hawkeye series at Marvel, which got nominated oh. for an Eisner. So he's a very talented, great guy. And also um, Ryan Hughes is the book designer. So um, he takes the gorgeous cover illustrations we have. We have so many covers for that first one. And he like, mm-hmm. you know, reformats them into the book design. So, mm-hmm. um, but that's our team. It's pretty, pretty small, just the five of us. Yeah, oh. keep it tight. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> good. And then now I'm going to start talking about your Substack because if I remember correctly, um, because when I did, when we, you know, when I interviewed you last year, um, when you started your Substack, I think you slowly, I think it like, it was a couple months after you started your Substack that the the story of Black Cloak appeared on your Substack um, originally. Is that correct? Yeah, we've been releasing it on the Substack. Um, by the time this goes out, people on the Substack will have read through chapter four. So uh-huh. uh, yeah, so they're getting the advanced look at it. Um, some people who pledged at like a higher level who get physical rewards, they'll be getting 
copies this week. I hope my copies are arriving tomorrow. They've mm -hmm. been delayed because of all the shipping, but shipping issues and weather problems in the U.S., I think. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's been really exciting. I mean, nothing... I don't think anything about the Substack has gone like exactly as you expect, but also yeah. a lot of us didn't know what to expect. It was a whole new mm -hmm. ground, but um, I, the experience has been pretty great. I mean, if nothing, even if, even if you don't like reading it digitally or mm -hmm. that's, you don't think a newsletter is for you, which I would say with social media being as unstable as it is, a newsletter is a pretty yeah. good way to keep track of, people that you're interested in keeping track of but um you know even if you're not into that at the end of the day substack funded this book so if you love it thanks substack <laughs> yeah yeah now also on on substack you have another series now correct me if i'm wrong on if i mispronounce the title it's called the the call is that correct yeah the call yeah yeah um i you know um because I I remember seeing I think um, at least a couple preview pages. Oh my god, one of them yeah. was incredible. It looked like a scene out of from the from the movie The Mist, where yeah. you know they see yeah. the huge giant creatures yeah. walking. The oh, yeah. It was yeah. Love. Um, yeah, no, this is, so this is my other book, which will be forthcoming from Image in 2023 as well. Mm -hmm. We're not on the schedule yet, so yeah. I would say summer is probably the earliest it'll start coming out, but this is a five-issue first volume. Um, mm -hmm. it will set up to be more, but there's going to have to be a break between the first five and whatever we else we do next, because Mattia has some other commitments in his schedule. But this is Mattia Delius, uh, drawing and, uh, color it's absolutely stunning it's completely different than black cloak which mm -hmm. i sort of love doing two completely different books that are still completely my thing like i'm so into them um maddie has got a super realistic style so i mean it just looks like a movie it's incredible mm -hmm. um and this is sort of the rough pitch for this is that it's sort of more like a grown-up goonies mm -hmm. plus you know, I don't know, otherworldly. I, I don't want to say Stranger Things, not because I don't think it's that or do think it's that. I just didn't really watch Stranger Things after season one, so I don't really know what it is, but... Yeah. It, there is like an otherworldly element here. Uh, these kids go on an adventure to film a short film. These, I shouldn't say kids, they're like 18. They've just graduated mm -hmm. high school. They're close friends who are basically going to go their separate ways. So they go off on one sort of last adventure and things go very sideways for them. And uh, it's definitely a horror book. It's an adventure, but it's also a horror. Um, and uh, it's been really fun doing it. We're working on issue three now. It's looking incredibly gorgeous. I've been holding back uh, the preview stuff just because, <laughs> you know, Mattia's style. <laughs> a lot of times when you put up preview stuff, you know, yeah. you can sort of fake it because it's out of context. So, like, yeah. even yeah. though you're showing a really spoilery panel, it's like well they don't know the context of this panel and so mm -hmm. you sort of it works but i feel like maddie's style is so highly detailed it's a little harder to get away with that because like it's very clear what's happening all the time you know okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh expect to see a lot more of that on the Substack uh this year as we build up to the launch again i, I hope it'll be summer for the print issues we'll see okay all right now i'm just going to start moving I'm going to slowly start wrapping things up. I'm going to start moving to your Marvel titles. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Your first one I want to talk about, it's it's um, it's called It's Jeff. Now, I know the first appearance. And now it's, uh, it's this little baby land shark that, walk, you know, that walks around. <laughs> I know his first appearance was in your West Coast Avengers run. And now it's um it's an infinity comic on the Marvel Unlimited. Now the series started um back in 2021, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it still kind of is going on on the uh, Marvel Unlimited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We just did season two. Season one was last uh, September 2021, mm -hmm. through, like the end of the year, and then this season was started in September, and it's 12 episodes again so i think there's one more 
issue still to come out, one more episode yes. still to come out. Uh -huh. And that is on Marvel Unlimited. But for those of you who've been wanting a print edition, that is finally coming in March. Uh -huh. I think it's March 29th. Okay. Um, and everyone should buy it. It would be hilariously amazing if it's Jeff beat out like Batman and Spider-Man that month. Wouldn't that be amazing? Let's do That'd that. <laughs> That would be really nice. <laughs> I haven't seen the proof yet, so I'm not exactly sure what it looks like. I hope they'll be sending that shortly. Um, but it said 48 pages in the solicit, so mm -hmm. I suspect it's both uh, both seasons uh, oh, okay. together. But yeah. but 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 I'm not positive. So uh -huh. anyway, it's got a, a really great Guri Hiru cover, which is the regular artist for the uh, Marvel mm -hmm. Unlimited series. And then it's also got an incredible Diwali cover. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. I apologize if that's wrong. Uh, it's been going around the internet. It's like sort of a Jaws riff, and it's really hilarious. So I'm, I'm loving it. Um, I believe there's another cover I haven't seen that's a uh, Ron Lim, I think. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So keep an eye out for those March 29th, I believe, last last week of March. And then correct me if I'm wrong, because I've, I've only... Now, please forgive me, Kelly, because... As, the, as we all know, there's a lot of comics out there. I've read, <laughs> I've read at least the first Infinity comic, and I, I love it. It's it's very cute. It it's a very um all ages series. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, because it's really cute. Yeah, no, it is all ages. It's definitely family friendly, and it's mostly silent. Um, it's mm -hmm. the only words in it. There's some sound effects, of course, mm -hmm. and then Jeff a lot of times says a version of Mur, which is like M R R. So he'll sometimes say versions of that, and then just people yelling his name. That's it. <laughs> Those are the only words. Um, and the premise is sort of. He's an absolutely adorable uh, little friend, but, you know, he's also a fucking shark. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, he eats everything and uh -huh. he's a little he's a little dangerous. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's great. It's great for kids. It's great for friends. I mean, it's great for adults. I try my best, even without words, to make every story clever enough that it can feel a little bit like the Simpsons where, you know, the Simpsons feels like it's for kids, but it also yeah. very much is doing something else. So yeah. we, we try to do that a little bit as much as we can. Yeah. It's been fun. Guri Hero are absolute geniuses. They, they're they storytelling masters. They can draw anything. Uh -huh. Sometimes sometimes I'll turn in one of those, it's Jeff's scripts, and I'm like, nah, it's not my favorite one. It's okay, but it's not my favorite. Yeah. And then we'll get the and then we'll get the layouts back from them. And I'm like, I'm wrong. It's my favorite one. <laughs> they're just so cute. They're so good at it. Now I'm gonna ask before I start moving on to your Captain Marvel title. Now, does Monarch and your other cat's name is Clive, correct? It's uh, yes, one of them. Yeah. Okay. So, as Monarch and Clive, do they give you some inspiration for some of the Jeff stories? <laughs> yes, for sure, for sure. Oh. I mean, Jeff is definitely. Um, I mean, people always want to say shark dog, and I'm like, Meh. if anything, he's a shark cat because <laughs> I write him, I created him, and I'm looking at cats. Um, <laughs> so to me, his personality is much more cat. But there's sure there's some dog in there, there's some shark in there, there's you know mischievous Jeff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the cats are an, an endless uh, stream of inspiration for sure. Okay. <laughs> now I'm just gonna move on to your Captain Marvel title. Um, you know. Um. You know, um, I know it's getting close to the 50th issue. Um, I know yesterday, January 3rd, issue 45 came out. Now, for me and for the listeners, may I ask, can you just, like, let us know what's the current storyline you're working on right now? We're doing such a fun story right now. It's a, it's a Captain Marvel brood storyline, which mm -hmm. I've been, you know, for people that know Captain Marvel, like, the brood is uh, one of her biggest nemeses. It's a... Uh, they sort of tortured her into becoming the woman that she is today in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, they unlocked her sort of binary powers. Um, she yeah. she became incredibly powerful after the manipulations of the brood. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm while she probably appreciates those effects, you know, nobody wants to be tortured. 
Um, so it's been a big nemesis for her. I've been wanting to get them back in the mix since we started the book, quite honestly, but the brood are, have been in a weird place with, in the Marvel universe because they've been under the control of a character called Brew, who's uh-huh. a little sort of intelligent hybrid brood. And he ate something called the king egg, which means he controls all the brood. And he's a good guy. He's the next man. So the brood haven't, they haven't really been enemies for a long time, Mm -hmm. for a while, at least since I've been doing my run. But things have been changing a little bit. And also we've been able to, you know, it was with the Krakoa era of X-Men, like it's a little trickier to get them as guest stars in books and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like, you know, to do a brood arc, I would want to bring the X-Men in. Mm -hmm. that's historically from the old chris claremont stories like how carol encountered the brood and you know she's pretty tight with the x-men it's really important relationships for me and i love the x-men characters so Mm -hmm. yeah i was really excited when we i wanted to do this big brood arc and i finally got the green light and then i got the green light for a bunch of my favorite x-men characters so we're having a great time the sergio davila is drawing most of the story most of the arc it's 43 through 49 is the brood arc and he's Mm -hmm. he's drawing all but issue 46 but the good news is javier um javier pina came on for issue 46 and it looks just as gorgeous so it's really fun all right a couple more questions um what is the most fun and exciting thing you love working in comics i think it's just the collaborations i mean Mm -hmm. It's it never gets old mm-hmm. to open your email box and have pages of things that you wrote mm-hmm. now realized into art and, and mm-hmm. making a story. It's magical. And it honestly, it doesn't get old. I, you know, I I sort of thought it was one of those things. I mean, I, I would say the only part of it that gets old is if 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 you're on a book and your team isn't right, you know, if there's something mm-hmm. wrong that can be a little heartbreaking because you know what it should look like or what it should Mm -hmm. be. And you got, and you know, you're not quite there. And I don't even mean that to, um, as a criticism to any artists, first of all, I've been incredibly lucky. And so that's very rarely happened to me, but you know, it's not a criticism, even when it happens, it's not typically, I would say a criticism of a specific artist or colorist Mm -hmm. or anything. It's a criticism of, it's just not the right fit. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes the best artist and the best writer in the world aren't maybe the right fit for each other. They're just interested in different things. I mean, that happened to me with an artist that I am a huge fan of. We were talking years about years ago about doing a creator owned and Mm -hmm. we had an idea that we thought was going to be interesting. We were working on it together. And just the more we talked, the more clear it became that we were, just totally interested in different things and Mm -hmm. I was super interested in narrative and this sort of procedural thing and these characters and they wanted to do something much more sort of psychedelic and Mm -hmm. sort of otherworldly and experimental maybe Mm -hmm. and we we ended up just sort of going our separate ways like in a nice way we were fine about it I think we just sort of looked at it and we went wow well, we'd still like to work together someday, but like, yeah. we're just not the right fit right now. And yeah. um, I I feel, I feel like that was totally the right decision. Like I have a little bit of regret in my heart about, mm-hmm. oh, well, maybe that was a missed opportunity. Maybe we could have figured it out. But I think we were actually just being like super practical and reasonable yeah. and like nobody wanted to waste their time. And I think, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I think I'm proud of us for like, taking that time at the beginning of a project and like really thinking about whether it was the right thing. So, Mm -hmm. you know. And I just want to make a comment because for Black Cloak, you and Meredith, and and I'm sorry, I forgot to put this in my note that, you know, you, you guys, this team for Black Cloak worked very well because it's, it's a passion project, you know, because you can really see, you know, um, it, it, it's a passion project, you know, uh, and it, it's a labor of love. And and I'm I'm not putting down your other works or you know, but it's just it it this one it um hits hits different. Yes, and it's very good. It 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 you know, <laughs> it, you know it, yeah, because Thank I love you. 
it's I love it's Jeff. And I'm sorry, Kelly. Again, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to read the Cap your Captain Marvel run yet, but I will. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but it's a lot of comics out there. We yes. can't read it all. We can't but, read it but, all. But like I said, again, Black Cloak just really sucked me in, literally in the first page. And then and then in like, you know, and then like the second and like either third or fourth page, it just pulls me literally into the world. Oh, well, I'm so glad. I mean, listen, I want people to love all my work. And, but if I have to choose, I would rather you love my creator own work more than my work for higher work for the very reason you're talking about. I put, I, I'm incapable of not like putting my whole self into every project I do, whether it's a work for hire thing or, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter. I, I am very bad at, I'm very bad at just doing something a little bit and being like, okay, that's oh, fine. Yeah. Like, cause I, mm -hmm. because I think sometimes that's probably smart. Like not everything should require the same amount of attention, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I do think there's a difference between writing black cloak and captain Marvel, yes. you know, there's difference in the limitations that are put on you, mm -hmm. uh, which can be a blessing and a curse. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's all sorts of factors here. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, you want that passion to come through. You want people to see that you truly love what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I'm glad if that's, if that's coming across, that's great. Yeah. Last question. Do you have any closing words to our listeners? Please buy Black Club. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> buy Black Cloak and more importantly, buy issue two as well. So yes. that uh so that we don't have a brutal attrition on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um and uh buy the coal when it comes out too. And yes. maybe subscribe to my newsletter so that we don't lose track of each other if Twitter implodes. Yes. Which sort of seems like it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Kelly, I wish you all the success with Black Cloak and also your Marvel titles. It's Jeff and Captain Marvel. You know, um, mahalo for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me another opportunity to interview. Thank you very much. You know, um, and I also, again, I want to thank Andrew of Image Comics for an advanced copy of Black Cloak number one. Now, if you are a new comic book reader or a lifelong comic book reader, Please check out, you know, um, Kelly's um, um, Black Cloak series from Image Comics. Issue one, you know, comes out on January 11th and issue two comes out on um, February 15th. You know, again, like I said, I love this first issue. I cannot wait for the second issue. Um, again, this first issue is very meaty. I mean, it's 51 pages and I love it because you know, in a sense, it's very satisfying. There's a lot of layers to this story with great characters. To me, the dialogue flows naturally, and it's set in an incredible fantasy world, you know, um, that's beautifully drawn, you know, and it's also very um, recognizable, and, and, you know, it is. Um, I want to thank Drew, the host of Comics for Fun and Profit, for putting this episode together. Drew, thank you very much for all your hard work behind the scenes. And if you are a new listener, please check out new episodes of Comics for Fun and Profit that comes out every Saturday. And I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you um, for listening to this episode. Until next time, guys. Aloha.